Well, good morning, Summit Church. Good to see everybody this morning. Y'all look better today than you did the last time I saw you. And, uh, of course, I don't have my contact in today either. But, uh, uh, hey, listen, I want to say thank you to everybody that has wished me a happy birthday uh, this past week. Um, I, my wife tells me that 60 is the new 40, so I'm going with that one. And, uh, but say, thank you so much for your wonderful wishes. We love you so much and account a privilege and honor to be serving the Lord with you and um, trust that you think, think the same as well. Hey, listen, water baptisms today, 5 o'clock down at the beach. Um, you can get directions. We'll be at actually Mobile Street, which is kind of down Fort Morgan Road a little bit. But looking forward to that today. I'm really excited. I love water baptism times. It's a landmark event in anybody's life. And if you've never been water baptized or uh, you feel like you've come into a new understanding of water baptism, which is what happened to me, um, I got baptized again. We encourage you to do that. Think about that. Pray about it. If you want to join us at 5, you can still join in at, at no problem. Well, listen, guess what? Today marks the one-year anniversary of our church, Summit Church. Come on. One year. Isn't that awesome? Come on. Wow. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, and, that, and thus, we have the Rita's Ice truck there outside the exit door when you leave. Free on us. Just take a cup of ice and uh, celebrate with us this incredible day. Landmark today. One year ago today, we launched out with uh, our church, Summit Church, and uh, can't believe how far God has brought us in just a short amount of time. In fact, what we want to do is just kind of recap this past year. So why don't we just watch the video together? We can kind of see together what God has done over the course of a year. Well, it's a lot happening in the course of a year, and I can't wait. Our new building is coming along. We now have all of the nursery rooms are all painted. They're actually, even, even as we speak, I think there's some people there 
working. I'm not sure why they should be doing that, but anyway, they're hanging the ceilings. You know, they're putting in the cross tiles in the ceilings uh, for the, all the nursery area. And uh, so that's happening even now. We got one of the walls of the back sanctuary. Uh, soon we'll be knocking out that north wall and uh, moving forward fast as we can. So thank you again for all your support and all that you continue to add to the kingdom and to Summit Church as well. Well, don't know if you heard about the little boy. His name was um, uh, Bobby, and Bobby had a habit of stretching the truth a little bit. And one day he was coming home from school and saw a large black dog jump out of the bushes right in front of him in the street. And he turned around and ran as fast as he could back to the house and ran to the house. He yelled, Mom, Mom, you're not going to believe what I just saw. What happened? Uh, a big black bear jumped out of the bushes and growled at me and raised up on all on his two paws and just began to chase me. And I, I, I outran him and got home just in time. And she began to be very concerned about Bobby's propensity to begin to exaggerate a little bit. And so a few days later, she uh, told her husband, who was away on a business trip, about, uh, about this, this particular event. And, and, and right after that, she did that, uh, Bobby walked in uh, to the room and saw his dad on the, uh, just got home. He said, Dad, you're not going to believe what just happened a couple of days ago. I was coming home from school, and a big black bear came out and chased me and tried to eat me. And I, I got away, and I, I made it just in time to the house before he got, got, got to me, ate me. And um, his father said, Son, I need to talk to you. Um, I, I need you to think about your story a little bit. And he goes, Okay. He says, now, now I want you to go to your room, son, and I want you to pray and talk to God about your story. Get on your knees and ask God what he thinks about the story you just told me. He goes, all right. He said, when you're done praying, you tell me what God says, all right. So he went to his room, closed the door. He was there a couple minutes. He bounced back out of the room. Dad, he talked to me. God talked to me. He talked to you already? He goes, yep. Told me everything I need to know about my story. Well, what did God say to you about your story? He said, God said, Bobby, don't worry about it, because when I first saw that dog, I thought it was a bear too. <laughs> ah, it's amazing how we can make stories fit uh, the way we want it to fit, right, in our, our narrative. Anyway, hey, listen, we're in a series called Upgrades. We all love upgrades. Upgrades are wonderful things. And we've been talking about the fruits of the Spirit and how fruits of the Spirit are in upgrades. I like upgrades. I, I remember I was coming home from a mission trip so, uh, quite a few years ago. I've been over um, in the Ukraine area for a couple of weeks, and I was kind of tired and ready to get home. And we got on one of those big jumbo, uh, um, big uh, airplane. And, and one of those kind of like three seats and then five in the middle and three on the other side, big, huge airplanes. And um, so I'm going down the aisle and all these people on this plane, and I'm looking at my seat, just wondering which one. I'm just hoping I don't get that middle section, right? And uh, that would be a long 10, 12-hour trip. So I, I'm looking, and sure enough, I'm in the middle section. Not only am I in the middle section, I'm in the middle seat of the middle section. For about 10 hours, that's going to be a long, long night. And I, and I was already tired. And, I, and so I sat down. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And about that, I said, Lord, please, no big people next to me. You know, please, I just, I'll, I'll take the middle seat, but just no big. Well, I'm telling you, probably the two biggest people on the plane, they saw the jumbo plane, and they said, that's for us. And they got on the plane, and they sat right next to me, one on each side. So much so that they like bled over into my seat. You know what I'm talking about? I'm just, they just kind of like, there was more people in the seat. And, and uh, so I literally had to spend the whole night like lean forward, you know, while they just kind of, because you know, no guy wants to be touching other guys. You know what I'm talking about? It's just like a guy thing. So I just, in order to be in touch, not touching them, them not touching me, I, I literally spent the whole night like this, sitting like that. I, and about that time, I thought to myself, I would give anything for an upgrade. You know what I'm saying? I, I would give my right arm, or, you know, I, my left ear, I, I, would, I could use an upgrade. I like upgrades, especially when I'm uncomfortable. I have some good news for you. God has given you an upgrade. He's given you nine upgrades, in fact, called the fruits of the Spirit. It's found in Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at this together. In fact, I want us to read this together like we did a couple weeks ago. Can we all do this? But the fruit
Awesome. The nine upgrades from the Lord into our life, the fruits of the Spirit. So we started this series a few weeks ago. If you're watching with us online, thank you for watching. Week one, we talked about love, the fruits of the Spirit, and the four different types, or three different types, main three types of, uh, of the fruit of love. One is called um, agape love, which is the, the incredible love of God that He gives us and how that love is unconditional. Then we unpacked joy, talked about how joy is our strength and we can run to joy and joy power. Pow- Powers us through circumstances in our life. And we talked week three about peace and how Jesus came back after the resurrection. He introduced himself to the disciples as peace. He said, listen, my peace I give to you. My peace I give to you again. He says it two different times and how we receive the peace of God, which is comfort, which is rest, which is completeness, which is safety, which is soundness, which is contentment, which is health. How many could use a little peace in your life from time to time, right? And yet God gave you that. That's yours to have. And then last week, Pastor Kip did a great job uh, ministering to us on the faithfulness and the faith of God. I so enjoyed that message. And now today, we're going to jump into the other two fruits. We're going to accomplish actually two fruits. We're going to talk about the kindness of God and the goodness of God as well. I believe those are two very important fruits that we need to operate in. We need to know. We need to live in. How many enjoy being around rude people? Just like you look forward to being around rude people. How many? Just okay. Y'all, y'all got something wrong with y'all. Okay, I'm just. I love you, but you got something wrong. How many love being around people that are kind? Come on, come on, raise your hand. There you go. I, I mean, I enjoy that. I grew up as a little child, and I was a. a um, I didn't really start growing vertically until after I graduated from high school, and uh, so I got the brute uh, of the jokes. You know, everybody wants to make fun of the little kid, right? You know, because you know they just want to because they 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 don't want anyone to make fun of them, so they make fun of the little kid. So I was always the last one to know it was raining and the first to drown. You know, I just never I never got any 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 respect, and so I was always made fun of. So when I became a youth pastor, I said to myself, "Man, I'm going to make sure." that we have an environment in our youth ministry where all young people come together and feel like it's a safe place where no one makes fun of them, no one um, you know, belittles them, no one um, you know, points them out or points out flaws. And so we did that and we created this incredible safe environment for our youth group. And, and uh, there were a couple of times I had to make sure that everybody understood that culture, that, they, that we're not going to do what you did like in school. We're not going to cut down people. That's not funny here. We're going to build people up. And, and we created that and, I, and we just watch these young people just grow and thrive in this environment of kindness and goodness. And and I believe it's important, our part of walking in the the Lord and in the Spirit is operate in the fruit of kindness. Let's talk about kindness, unpack it for a few minutes. Kindness is what's used or referred to in the New King James Version, but in the King James Version, it says good or gentleness. It's the same basic word, kindness or gentleness. In the Hebrew, the form of that word would be a humility, or to bend low, or fairness. In the New Testament, again, they use the word kindness as the word gracious, being gracious, or gentle, or useful. Uh, I I know that it's important to, to operate in kindness. So let's look at this, kindness this morning, exploring the aspects of kindness. Number one, we need to know that kindness begins with humility, It begins with humility. How do we know this? Well, God demonstrated his kindness towards us by doing what? By humbling himself and reaching out to lost man. It was David who understood this aspect of God who would write in the book of Psalms 18, he said, God, you stooped down to make me great. Let me say it again. God, you stooped down to make me great. We have a God that knows how to stoop down because he loves us. I, uh, my wife and I have been out of town the last couple of weeks and we came back and last, last night and uh, she was unpacking and getting everything uh, unpacked and, and uh, I said, listen, I got, I got to go over and see um, Hannah and Patrick. And she goes, well, it's really kind of late. And uh, I said, well, I really got to go. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I called up Hannah and I said, hey, uh, is Ava Grace awake? You know, which is my granddaughter. And she goes, no, I just put her down to bed. I said, well, wake her up. 
She was down. I'm not waking her up. I just put her down. I said, I don't care. Wake her up or I'm going to wake her up. I'm coming over. <laughs> Click. You know, and so I, I had to. I just had to. So I get over there at Ava Grace's. Her hair's all over. And, and I walk in the door. And I walk in the door. I go, smiles. I call her smiles. Smiles. And what did I do? My first instinct was to do this. Smiles. She's only 17 months old. And she saw me. And she goes, run into me. Come on. And we just had a wonderful time together. What happens? I, I had to stoop down. Why am I stooping down? Because I want to be on her level. Why am I want to be on her level? Because I love her. And I want to communicate. I want to share. I, want to, I came a long way just to see this little 17-month-old guy, girl. Come on. I, I got to stoop. I, when God stooped down, what he was saying to us is, I love you so much that I'm willing to come down to your level. Come on. And I want to show you my character. I want to, sh- I want to do life with you. David understood this. Again, it's demonstrated when he was coming out of the palace because Absalom, his son, had revolted against him and turned the whole country against him. And so David is coming out of Jerusalem, his palace. And, and as he's walking out of the, in, in broken hearted, I mean, he, he couldn't believe his son had turned on him like this and literally turned everyone against him. And he's broken hearted, surrounded, David is now, by his mighty men and some soldiers. And, and this guy named Shimei comes out and sees David coming out, and he begins to run up and he curses him and cussing him out and throwing dirt in David's face. And actually, the Bible says picking up stones and throwing them and, and, and continue to curse him. As David continued to walk, not responding to this guy Shimei, this guy continued to follow and throw stones and throw dirt and cuss and curse. Who knows how many miles this went on. And finally, uh, 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 Abishai, who was um, David's mighty man, his bodyguard, says, let me kill this guy. He's a dead dog. He, he should, no one talks to my king, my boss, David, like this guy. And David's response to him was classic. He goes, leave him alone. He's got rocks flying. Just leave him alone. Why? No one does this to a king. And David's response implied that maybe God wanted to teach him something through all of this. How many times do you look at people that cause you a bunch of trouble and think, maybe God's trying to teach me something? <laughs> Not very often, right? But definitely, definitely David. And so my, my, my thought is that maybe when we understand that God is gentle, we aren't quick to judge other people and lash out at people like we tend to do. It's hard to show kindness while at the same time I'm judging their motives, isn't it? Jim Simbola tells a story about his mother and how he, and he's a great preacher up in New York, and how he grew up uh, in, in a very holiness-type background church, which uh, didn't allow the women to wear makeup or um, pantsuits or things like that. They couldn't wear red shoes, couldn't wear red lipstick, couldn't put makeup on, couldn't cut their hair. They just really felt like, the, you know, that if you did any of that stuff, you weren't holy. And so, they didn't know, the church that he grew up, that his father, his mom's husband, uh, was an alcoholic. And he would many times come home from work after binging on alcohol and would beat her up. And one particular weekend, he did exactly that and beat her to a pulp, and she had this huge black eye. Wanting to go to church, she felt embarrassed to go with a black eye, so she put on makeup to cover her eye. And she went to church and only to find out that the majority of the women in the church afterwards began to talk about her behind her back and say that she had compromised her faith and that she was a worldly person. She had a Jezebel spirit and, 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 and she needed to get right with God and repent because she's becoming like the world now. They had no clue that she was covering up a bruise that she'd been beaten by her own husband from and that she was just wanting to be a part of the body of Christ and so she put on a little makeup to cover it up. But yet we judge people so quickly, don't we? Come on. Thinking that we know all the facts and all the details when we really don't know anything. I like what the person said. It says, if you wash another person's feet, then you will learn why they walk the way they walk. Oh, yeah, okay, I'll say it again. <laughs> if you wash another person's feet, if you'll humble yourself, then you'll know why they walk the way they walk. People don't walk the way they walk just because they woke up and decided to be a troublemaker. 
There's many times it's faults, yes, inside of them, but it came from somewhere. It's a hurt. There's a wound. Maybe you should humble yourself a little bit, understand why. What's interesting about this story that I just share with you is that three chapters later, the same guy, as now David's walking back into Jerusalem to take back his throne that he had lost temporarily as he's walking back in, the same guy that's throwing dirt and cussing and cursing him falls at his feet and goes, forgive me, forgive me. I, I, I was stupid. I had a stupid moment. Forgive me. And David does. It, gentleness, kindness, it starts with humility. Number two, I need to understand that I experience God's kindness as I surrender to him. You, you, I can never experience God's kindness without surrendering first to him. Isaiah 40, verse 11, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart and he gently leads those that have young. That word gently leads literally means he gently leads to a place of rest. He gently leads to a place of rest. In other words, God's gentleness towards me brings rest to my spirit and to my soul. This is the kindness of God. It's, I experience it only when I surrender to him. I can't experience the gentleness of God without surrendering to him. But once I do, aren't you, aren't you grateful for his gentleness? Come on, can somebody say amen? He's a gentle God. Mm. Number three, kindness must be shown to everyone. I would rather say kindness must be shown to almost everyone. <laughs> just, just, just almost. I'll, I'll go with almost everyone. That, that at least gives me the opportunity to exempt out and opt out of a, a couple of instances where I don't have to be kind. <laughs> Come on, because we all got that person that neighbor, that coworker, that relative, that spouse, that child, come on, where you just rather not be kind at this moment. 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. See, kindness is not passive. It goes out of its way to show kindness. Look at this, 1 Peter 2.3, you have tasted that the Lord is bad. Oh, what does it say? You taste the Lord is gracious. The Lord is good. We've experienced the God. And when I, when I taste it, when, I, when, you, when you taste something, you, you go, oh, that's sour. Or, oh, that's sweet. Or, oh, yeah. When you taste God, all you can say is, oh, he's gracious. He's kind. He's good. That's what he is. Good. The word good is the word Christos in the Greek. It means gentle. A kind person is looking around at all the needs around him. And he, you know what he wants to do? He wants to do something about it. That's what a kind person does. A kind person looks around and sees deficiencies in his community, in his uh, workspace, and pe people he works with, and wants to do something about it. And so makes sacrifices towards other people and other in, in order to alleviate their pain and their hurt. Oh, you need propane in your grill. Sorry about that. Hope you can somehow figure out how to cook your steaks without any propane. No. You, I'll, hey, you need some propane? Here, here's some of my propane. You need, you, you need, you need some help in babysitting the kids? Here, I, hey, we'll take our Friday night. We'll babysit your kids for you. You need a break. Can I take your son fishing? I know he hasn't, you know, have a, he doesn't have a father or his father travels a lot. Can I take your son fishing? Teach him how to fish a little bit. Can I take you a meal because I see, heard that you're not feeling good? Can I, can I help you out a little bit? Can I, can I just, you know, help you maybe learn a trade or can I help you uh, get into college? Can I adopt a child? Can I support a missionary? Can I give oil changes to single mothers or widows? Can I, can I mentor a child and, and, and be a father or mother to them? Can I, can I love on the unlovely? Can I help out in someone? Can I just show a little kindness? That, that's what kindness is. The good news is, here's what the good news is, what we just saw in the video. You know what? We have a kind church. I, I believe I am totally surrounded by kind people. 
I mean, I, 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 I actually probably don't even need to be preaching this to you because you're so kind. So I'll just preach to myself, all right? So I'm going to preach to me and y'all just listen. But, but I, I believe we have an incredibly kind church. Question for you, who is the kindest person you've ever known? I mean, just take a moment think back through your life. Who is the kindest person you've ever known in your life? I, I, I try to answer that myself. I asked Melissa, and we, 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 and we, we kind of thought to ourselves, and you know what? I couldn't name just one. There's so many kind people I've experienced in my life. And at different times, at different seasons, different people have stepped up and just shown, these, shown me this incredible kindness, this kindness I didn't even deserve. What is that? That is the fruit of the Spirit of God. It's selfless in nature. Something that you choose to do. Number five, we learn that kindness endears you to people's heart. Well, let me just go. Did I do number four? Did I do four? Oh, okay, so I just gave you five. So we'll hold that. Go back to number four. Number four, it's not your nature to be kind. You don't wake up and go, woo, I'm a kind guy. <laughs> I was born kind. I grew up being kind. You know, I, I'm talking to my little granddaughter. You know, her first letter, and her, her first word that she's learned, I hate to say this, but is the word no. <laughs> I'm like, at least Papa or something like that, but no. It's not our nature to be kind. Romans 3.10, there's no one righteous, not even one. <laughs> you can't, we're not born. See, the philosophy of our day and our age is that everybody's good. Can I just say that is a flawed philosophy? We are born rotten to the core. It is Christ that has to come and redeem us and save us even from ourselves. The hardest deal, Moody said this, the hardest thing God has to do is to make people kind. I mean, the difference, I mean, look at animals. Animals are not kind to one another. I mean, they live in a jungle. You try to take a wild animal and try to somehow uh, make it, you know, so, something that, you know, can be inhabited with people. And many times we've realized we can't do that. We have to put them in cages just to enjoy looking at a wild animal. Why? Because it's not their nature to be kind. They, they want to hurt. They want to do damage. They want to kill. It's, it's their nature. And, and the only thing that separates me from an animal is when I step up and I, I decide to be kind and I walk in the spirit and not in my flesh, not in my soul. It's a challenge to be kind because I live in a world that says, me first, what's in it for me? Oh, you want me to do you a favor? Okay, what do I get out of the deal? That's the world we live in, but kindness is something I have to develop. It's the selfless nature that I live with. Number five, kindness endears me to people's heart. This is what I was mentioning to you. Rehoboam is the classic story. He's the king that inherited the throne of Israel right after Solomon. We've heard of Solomon and what a wise man he was and what a great king he was. At the epic peak of Solomon's rule of reign, Israel was the powerhouse of the world. He had taken from David this small country and made it bigger and larger and powerful. And now he is passed on and all these great things that he had done now falls into the lap of his son, Rehoboam. Rehoboam. So Rehoboam steps up to the plate to be the new king and in walks some representatives of the nation. And they said, King Rehoboam, can we have audience? He said, sure. They said, we, we recognize you as the new king, but we have one request. He said, what's that? He says, your father Solomon is a good man, but he has taxed us so much. I mean, I, we appreciate all the great things he's built, the palaces, the gardens, and all the wonderful things that we have, but we are really taxed to the hilt and our backs are heavy from the tax. Would you mind considering giving us a break? We just need a break, just so we can enjoy what we have. Rehoboam said, well, let me have a, some time. to Come back in three days. Let me think about it. So they came back in three days. But in the meantime, Rehoboam went to the old seasoned 
wise advisors of Solomon. He said, here's what the people have said. What do you think I should do? And they responded to him in the book of 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 7, said, Rehoboam, be a servant to these people. Serve them. Give them a favorable answer. And they'll always work for you. That, was this, that comes from the older generation. Come on, servant leadership. Come on, Rebo, just, that's, uh, you're in a position of authority to serve others. Come on, isn't that what politicians are supposed to do, right? They're a public service. I don't sure they understand that sometimes, but that's, that's, that's what he's supposed They said, just serve. If you, if you serve, if you get underneath them and serve them, then they will turn around and serve you for the rest of their lives. That's, let me help you know, the older people have got something to offer, <laughs> the, the younger generation. And so he said, well, okay, I hear what you're saying, but let me call my buddies uh, that I grew up with. You know, they're, they're in this thing with me, and we play ball together, and, and they got some good things to say. What, what y'all think? So he calls in the young bucks, and they go, what did they, what did the old guys say? What did them old guys say? They, say, he's, they, they said to serve, you know, just to get in, just serve these people, and just listen to their heart, and just... Go with it. They're like, are you kidding me? Listen, Rehoboam, you're the new sheriff in town. You need to let them know where the buck stops. You need to let them know who drives the bus. You need to let them know who's the boss now. Come on, get with them. Let them know you're the, you're the big bad king. So the people come back after three days. Mr. Rehoboam, king, do you have a decision or request? He goes, oh, yeah, I got a decision. You think Solomon's, you think his rule was bad. You haven't seen nothing yet. In fact, they said, he ruled you with a whip, but I will rule you with a scorpion. In other words, I, I, I'm letting you know right now that I, I'm the new king and things are going to get even worse and even harder for you. Don't be asking for favors anymore. Don't be coming back up in here asking me to relent like that. No, don't you, don't you think I'm going to be kind to you? And because he lacked kindness, those representatives walked out and they said to him, you know what? We don't need you as our king. We'll make our own kingdom. And those 10, nation, ten tribes gathered together and separated themselves from the whole nation of Israel, left Rehoboam, the new king, with only two tribes. And for the rest of the history, those, that country of Israel separated and divided and never ever came back, again, back together again. In fact, for the rest of history, they would literally fight against each other, brother against brother, and, and be angry at one another and make divisions and hurt one another. And the king them never ever became unified again, all because one man who was in a very opportune moment of history decided he was not going to show kindness, but he was going to show greed. He was going to show a hardness and, and, and be a cruel man. I want you to know that God gives you opportunities and set seasons for you to show kindness. And if you will show kindness, it will bring people together. It will make people love one another. It will cause people to enjoy one another. God brought you to the place that you're in so you can turn around to your left and to your right and show kindness to your brother and kindness to your sister and bring healing to a land. That's what our land needs. It needs healing. It needs kindness. Where's the kindness in our land? And for the rest of all of history, people's lives were changed that it were at one time brothers and sisters because this one man decided not to be kind. Breaks my heart. Number six, kindness is an attitude followed by an action. Forgiving another person is an action that has an attitude of, I love you despite what you've done to me. Opening the door, letting someone get in line complimenting someone. All these, obviously, we didn't understand all these things. But Jesus demonstrated kindness everywhere he went. He would take a woman caught in adultery and say, no, you, your law says that she should die, but I'm, I'm not, we're, we're not going to do that. He showed what? He showed kindness. Many think that David's greatest act of a man was his killing of Goliath. And you can tweet this one. Greatest 
act of David wasn't killing Goliath, but it was not killing Saul. Saul was the king that he was serving underneath at that time, who had chased after David trying to kill him. David's greatest act wasn't killing Goliath, it was not killing Saul. When he had an opportunity to kill Saul, when Saul came to relieve himself in the cave that David happened to be finding, and when Saul was chasing the very man who was hiding in the cave, he chose to relieve himself in, and while he was doing his business, David slipped over there and cut a piece of Saul's robe off of him, and when Saul left the cave to go on his journey to find David, David comes out of the cave and holds up the piece of robe that, of the king that he'd just cut off and says, hey, you're missing something? And, 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 and the Bible tells us that story, and David afterwards was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of the king's robe. Conscious stricken. He, he, the Spirit of the Lord grabbed him and said, what do you think you're doing? I'm sure I, I could hear David go, what do you think I'm doing? This man is chasing. He's trying to kill me for crying out loud. At least I could just humiliate him a little bit. And God's like, what do you do? You know I did not give you that authority. I didn't give you that privilege, that opportunity, that, that liberty to humiliate someone that I made king. If you're going to be king, David, it's going to be on my conditions, and I'm going to do it. You don't have to go around humiliating people and hurting people just in order to become something that you think you deserve. He was stricken in his conscience. It wouldn't be long after that that he would become king. But guess what? He became king and had nothing to do with it. God took care of it and made it happen. That was a hard lesson for me to learn. The kindness is an attitude followed by an action. Which brings us to the last fruit we want to talk about this morning, not the last one, but what we'll talk about today is that the fruit of goodness. The fruit of goodness. One who is praiseworthy in character. One who is morally excellent. Oh, isn't that a great, great fruit? Come on. Someone who's praiseworthy in character. Someone who's morally excellent. Goodness, it's a moral obligation to act in another person's benefit, helping them accomplish goals and desires that they have by removing barriers from this person's life, by going in and taking obstacles that this person has and helping them remove those things and just being good to a person that perhaps doesn't even, in your opinion, deserve it. The Bible says that God is good. In fact, Acts chapter 10, 38, it says Jesus went about doing what? Good. He went about doing good. Jesus came to the earth and everything he did, it was about being good, showing goodness, showing kindness to people that came across his path. Do people say that about you? When they think about you, does the words goodness and kindness come to their mind, first of all? Oh, yeah, Ricky, yeah, man, what a good man he is, right? Susie, well, well I, I tell you what, that kindest person I've ever met in my life. It's a fruit. It's a fruit of your life. Goodness, kindness. Interesting story. We read in the book of Exodus that, that Moses wanted to see God's glory. He's leading these three million knuckleheads through the wilderness. And they're just like bumbling it all up and complaining all the time. And Moses is like exhausted and finally cries out and says, God, I got, I got to see your glory. I need a break here. And the only thing I can think of is if I can see your glory, then maybe uh, I, 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 it'll give me the fortitude. Uh, it'll give me the, the umspach. Is, is that a good word? Umspach, we say that? They give me the, the stuff to get through this mess I'm in. Oh God, I just want to see your glory. And, and the Bible says, God says, well, you're not going to see my glory because it'll, you're not going to see me. It's my face. You're not, I'm not going to let you see my face, my glory. It'll destroy you. So what I'll do is I'm going to put you in the cleft of this rock and I'm going to walk by you. I'm going to cover you with my hand. And when I walk by, the Bible says that when God walked by, what Moses saw was the back of God. Let me just read it. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord says, I will cause all of my 
goodness to pass in front of you. I will put you in a cleft of the rock, cover you with my hand till I pass by. Then I will see, then, then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face will not be seen. So Moses, here's what I'm saying. Moses wanted to see God's glory. God says, you're not going to see my glory, but you will see the best, the, the, the thing what glory is made out of. And it's called my goodness. And so Moses is in a cleft of the rock waiting to see God's glory and God walks by, covered up. He can't see God because God's got his hand there and finally the hand is removed and he sees God's back and what he sees is the goodness of God. What am I saying? I'm saying everywhere God goes, uh, he leaves a trail behind him of nothing but good things. Well, God, I, I want to see your glory. Well, I, you're going to see my glory because wherever I go, I'm going to leave behind things that are good, good things, good works, good deeds. Uh, people whose lives are going to be lifted up. Their, their, their character, their, their mentality, their personality, their, their lives are going to be touched and redeemed. Why? Because you've walked by and because you're filled with my glory. You're going to do good things. Things are going to fall off of you that are good and people are going to be blessed uh, and, and, and you're going to be a manifestation of my glory in the earth. The glory of God is connected to the goodness of God. You can't see the goodness of God without seeing the glory of God. You can't see the glory of God without seeing and experiencing the goodness of God. They go like this together. People are put into my life, though, from time to time to reveal my goodness. And usually those people are very difficult people. Come on. It takes no sweat to be good to someone who's good, right? Anybody can be good to someone who's good to you. I mean, that's, that's just easy. But somehow God seems to say, you know, if you want to walk in, in goodness, then you need to have something to be good towards that doesn't deserve to be shown good things. Oh, I know I'm preaching good because it's really quiet. <laughs> See, there's diff there are difficult people in your life, and I'm convinced, you cannot tell me otherwise, God will put difficult people right in your path in order to reveal his goodness from your life. They will never experience the goodness of God unless they experience it flowing from your life. Difficult. I'm talking about difficult. I'm talking about stubborn, mean. I mean, how many know what I'm talking about? Have you experienced a mean person in your life? Come on. Am I the only person? Seriously? The rest of you haven't experienced mean? Where? I need to be in your life <laughs> and live your life. I've experienced flat out mean people get up in your face, cussing at you with spit coming all over your face as they're cussing at you. Come on, I'm talking about mean people, difficult people, selfish people, greedy people. And these are the people you want to like read my hand, read my palm. Just, and, but God goes, no, no, no. I caused that neighbor to move right beside you for a reason. They need to see my glory. And the way they're going to see my glory is they're going to see your goodness. And the gooder you are, the greater my glory is going to be that they see. And so, so people come in and, 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 and they're, they're, they're saying, Man, Pastor, I got a really difficult person I'm dealing with, and I don't know what to do with this difficult person. Well, on a scale of zero to 10, how, how bad are they? Um, they're like a seven on the difficult scale. I mean, seven. They're moving quickly to a 7.5. I, I, I mean, at 10, I'm about to, I'm going to bust. Uh, I'm going to go ape on, I'm going to kamikaze on this person. They're about to flip my lid. And, and what, what do I do? I said, well, they're at a 7.5. What you need to do is raise your goodness level to about an 8. <laughs> and cause your goodness to overwhelm their difficulty. 
Listen, the reason people go off the handle and are at, go literally ballistic is because there's something inside of them that has hurt or wounded. And on top of that, they're coming in contact with something that's confronting them in the spiritual dimension that you don't even see. So what you got to do is you got to pour it on. Pour it on. Oh, the more you, okay, the meaner you are to me, the gooder I'm going to be. Go ahead, slap this cheek. See if I won't let you slap this one. You want to slap this one? How's that, how's that feel? How, slap this one again. You enjoy that? Getting a good workout? Good. I love you, man. You want to have come to my house for dinner tonight? Oh, you need, a, you need a shirt? Here, I'll give you my shirt. I'll give you my coat, too. Oh, you want me to carry this bag with you for a mile? I'll carry it two miles. Come on. The Bible tells us. It's always in motion. Do good. Do good. Everywhere Jesus went, he did good things. God put his spirit inside of you so the fruit of goodness will flow out of you, and it will just splash over all the difficult people around. Oh, it's the goodness. It's not something I work for. It just flows out of me. You don't have to work. I'm going to get up. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. No, that doesn't work, right? I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. Ah! Oh. No, it just flows out. So you don't work at it. It just flows out of your spirit. That's why you need to be filled with the spirit. Lastly, worship team, come on up as we get ready to close. And remember, read his eyes. is right outside waiting for you, okay? It's free, all right? It's free. Some of you are like, well, how much is this going to cost? It don't cost you anything. It's a good day. <laughs> Talking about the goodness. I can't charge you for something. We're celebrating a year of anniversary. Zacchaeus. Remember that story, Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. And he had a sycamore tree. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. Remember that story? Jesus passing through Jericho. Zacchaeus was the tax collector for the city. He was a Jew himself, but was the tax collector. No one liked Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus would charge people unfair amounts of taxes, would slide it into his pocket, and that's why he had such nice house, perhaps. That's typically what tax collectors would do. They would had their own, so they had nice things as everyone at the expense of everybody else. And so no one liked the tax collector typically for the city because they felt like they had turned their back on their own peers, their own friends. And Zacchaeus, no doubt, was no different. The thing about Zacchaeus, he's a very short man, vertically challenged, and so he wanted to see Jesus, heard about this Messiah passing through town, goes on ahead of Jesus, climbs up in the tree so he can get a good view of Jesus. Jesus passing through the town, surrounded by hundreds, perhaps thousands of people, touching him, pushing him, talking, Jesus, 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 walking through town. He's the superstar. He's the rock star. He's the man of the hour. He is just everywhere he goes. Things are happening, exploding. Earthquakes taking place in people's communities. He's walking through Jericho, no doubt the same thing's happening. He gets right there to the sycamore tree, looks off, goes, hey, what's up? Said, Keith, why don't you come on down? I want to have dinner at your house tonight. What? Jesus wants to have dinner at the tax collector's house. He couldn't have it at somebody else's house who was a nice person, a good person who deserves to be, you know, at his house. He's got to pick the tax collector. Tax, and, and Zacchaeus, he rambles down the tree and he stands before Jesus. And Jesus hadn't said a word to him. He didn't get in his face and go, now, not only are you a wee little man, but you're a snake. I mean, he didn't, he didn't say that. Come here, little Zacchaeus. Let me give you a piece of God's mind. <laughs> These are God's people. Look how you're treating them. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Zacchaeus legs like, do you think I could destroy you right now? I could pinch your head off. I'm sitting here from God. I'm here to point the wrath of God and I bring judgment. He didn't do nothing to that. He just goes, and says, hey, you want to have dinner tonight? Zacchaeus scrambles down the tree Looks at Jesus. I imagine there was a moment of time I could see tears coming down Zacchaeus' cheeks. And he says, I tell you what, 
I'm going to give half of everything I have away. And if I've done anyone any wrong, I'm going to give them back four times what they've given me. If I've done anything wrong, I'm going to give back four times what I owe them. And that's how he experienced Jesus. That's how he experienced Jesus. He was affected physically and emotionally and challenged spiritually by the kindness of this man who hadn't said a word to him yet other than let's have dinner. So much so, play it out. Let's just kind of just do a little role play for just a second if that's okay. Zacchaeus no doubt had several enemies in the community that he had taken advantage of. Joe, perhaps the farmer on the edge of town, had had a bumper crop that year. Zacchaeus realized there was a spot he could get some, some money from, a guy he could get some money from. So he, he goes, perhaps it was the year before, to Joe's house, the farmer, and instead of charging him the typical $1,000 for taxes that he would owe, he charged him $10,000. And Joe's like, Zacchaeus, look, Look, dude, I can't pay you 10. I don't even owe you 10. I owe you 1,000. This is the amount that we all pay for taxes. Why are you doing this to me? Because I can. Now give me your 10,000 or I'll have you put in jail. And, and, and he had to perhaps give or sell a, a, an oxen. Perhaps he had to sell two of his oxen. Perhaps, you know, he had to borrow money from his relatives. Perhaps now after a year of this kind of life, he's been working himself to the bone. He's hardly sleeping at night. He's hardly eating. He hardly sees his kids. Uh, his wife is so upset because they're in this bad position financially because of that wicked man Zacchaeus in town who's now living high on the hog at their expense, who has now a nice swimming pool and a tennis court and a bowling alley underneath his house, uh, all at their expense. And you can imagine the anger and the bitterness that they live with because of this rudeness and meanness of this man who took advantage of them. And she's sitting there at the table and perhaps they're at the table and he's sitting there with his two kids and he's about to fall asleep in his food because he's worked 16 hours for the last 45 days just trying to get ahead, trying to get back to where they were. And they hear this on the door. And Joe scoots back from the table and he goes to the door bloodshot eyes, weary, can hardly walk. From a hard day's work, he opens the door and there, who is that? It's the rat, the snake, the mean little man, Zacchaeus, the hateful, greedy little spider. Can't think of anything worse. <laughs> and he goes, seriously? What do you want now? How much do you want now? No, I, I don't want nothing. Well, why are you here for crying out loud? Who is it, Joe? Hold on. What do you want? I've already given you 10000 that I did not owe you. I'm working myself to a bone just because of you so you can build your fancy little house on this side of town. What do you want now? Zacchaeus says, I want... I want to apologize, Joe. What? I'm, I want to say I'm sorry. What? I, I know, I know. Joe, I'm telling you, I'm sorry for what I did. And, and, and I was totally, totally in the wrong. And, and Joe, I, I, I just want to ask your forgiveness. Would you mind? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Joe, I, I was in town a couple days ago and a guy walked through town and they call him the Messiah. They call him Jesus, the Son of God. And, and he just asked me to walk, walk him to my house and have dinner with me. And, and, and Joe, my life's changed. And, and I realized, I, I mean, I couldn't even sleep last night, Joe. I, all I could think about is, how wrong I've done you. Joe, will you forgive me? And in fact, Joe, here, and he hands him an envelope. Here, Joe, here, 
I want to give you this. And Joe takes it. Zacchaeus, I'm sorry for taking your time. I know you're eating. Have a good night. Joe, I, I love you. And he turns around and leaves, and Zac Joe shuts the door and looks at the envelope and walks to the kitchen, to the dining room, and his wife says, who is that? And Zacchaeus. What did that rat want? Wants some more money? Where is he? No, I'm going to go get him right now. I'm going to get a piece of my mind. I'll tell that guy what to do. No, hold on, sweetheart. What? 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 He actually apologized. Well, that don't do us any good. We are in debt up to our eyeballs. What the good does it buy? Why would he? What does that mean? I don't know, but he gave me this car. What's in the car? And he opens it up. 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 30,000. $40,000, four times what he had taken from, from Joe. It's $40,000. I can see his wife go, let me count that. <laughs> You've always been bad with numbers, you know. It is, it's $40,000. What, what, what's happened? What's, what's this about, what's it? I don't know, sweetheart, but I remember saying something like, like he met Jesus and, and the kindness of Jesus overwhelmed him. Have you ever been overwhelmed by the kindness of Jesus? You need to be overwhelmed by the kindness of Jesus. Everywhere he went, he went about doing good. It's a fruit of the Christ that lives inside of you. Kindness just flows out of you. Not mean, not angry, not upset, not bitter, just kind. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me for a second? If you've never experienced this kind of kindness, today you can experience this. How? Pastor, through a relationship with Jesus, through a relationship with the Son of God. You can touch this kindness. You can experience it. You can, you can literally walk in this kind of supernatural kindness. How do you do that? By, by surrendering your life, by giving your life to Him. Yeah. By saying, I, I, I'm going to take my hands off of the wheel and I'm going to totally let Jesus take over Today, my question to you is, do you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Have you asked Jesus into your life? Are you willing to surrender and lay down your life so his life can live through you? If you're here and you say, Pastor JP, I, I want to do that. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender my life. Then I want you to raise your hand right where you're at. Will you do that? I want to pray with you. Yes. Come on, who else? I want to give my life to Jesus. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, sir. I want to give my life to Jesus. Anybody else? I want Jesus in my life. I want Jesus in my life. Yes, thank you. You can put your hands down. I want to just pray a prayer with you this morning. In fact, I would ask all of us to pray this prayer. I call it a prayer of salvation. We literally ask Jesus into your heart. If you raise your hand, pray this, and as well, everyone else, can you say this with me? Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And today I surrender myself to you and your purpose. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, come on, can we give God some praise for that, man? That's awesome. That's awesome. Amen. Our prayer teams are going to be on the side right over there by that table. And we want to pray with you. Before we do, I, I want to pray a prayer for all of us this morning. So can we all just stand to our feet and 
Let me ask you a question. How many, how many here would say, I need a little bit more kindness in my life? You're going to see a show of hands? Come on. How many would say both hands, right? Come on. Both hands. Amen. Let's just keep, can we just keep our hands up and just let me lead you in a prayer. Father, thank you that you give us your spirit and the fruit of kindness and goodness that lives inside of us. Thank you that you're challenging us today and Holy Spirit showing us people and opportunities and situations in which we can show kindness. Thank you, Lord God, for that gift, that fruit that we've been given. And Lord God, we decide today to walk fully in total abandonment into the fruit of kindness, the fruit of goodness, and we're going to see the result of it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, can you give God some praise? Come on, let's give God some praise. Thank you, Lord. We will see you Wednesday night. Don't forget, Serena's eyes. God bless you. Let's have a great afternoon and show some kindness. Yeah.